My wife and I started watching Mythic Quest, a 2020 Apple TV Plus comedy in midsummer of 2021. The first season, so titled Raven's Banquet, has nine episodes, plus two specials that dropped after the season finale. But I had already decided I had something to say about this show after we finished watching episode five, titled A Dark, Quiet Death. Spoilers, and also non-spoilers warning here, I guess. We'll be talking about the show up to and including that fifth episode, but no further than that, since I'm coming at this from the perspective of what this episode does to and in its immediate context. Now, A Dark, Quiet Death is pretty unique. It is, as far as one could know after watching it, an entirely standalone episode, with no overlap in character or story from the show up to this point, save for a tiny, mid-credits punchline of a scene. It also takes some dramatic departures in tone, structure, and pacing from the show it's ostensibly a part of, functioning almost as a different genre of television, with only the barest tether to its kin. Namely, this episode, like previous episodes, is at least partially about video games and or the video game development industry. And it's a pretty good episode of TV. If Mythic Quest were some kind of vignette series about the video game industry or the tech industry writ large, a dark, quiet death would be a nice piece worth applauding on its own merits. I'm happy to do just that too, and we'll be discussing what makes the episode work, but Mythic Quest is not at all a Twilight Zone-esque glance across the landscape of its subject matter. It is, at least four episodes in, a structurally conventional, semi-serialized workplace comedy, a la The Office or Superstore with video game development itself functioning more as a unique backdrop than a thematic runner. I don't think it's a very good comedy either, and I think the relative successes of A Dark Quiet Death only make the larger series failures that much clearer to me, in a way that makes for a really interesting study of contrasts. So let's do a quick rundown of A Dark Quiet Death. This episode takes the form of a few extended vignettes spanning a time period from the mid-90s to the early aughts, and principally follows two characters who nickname each other Doc and Beans in a cute riff on the Sega Genesis game Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Doc and Beans meet cute in a blockbuster-esque games rental store. Beans is a moody, goth-styled young woman with a very particular taste in video games and a disdain for the vast majority of other games. Doc is a charming, genuine-seeming games developer who entices her to develop her own game if she's disappointed in the ones on offer. In the years that follow, they create their own game development studio, sell a game titled Dark Quiet Death, and navigate increased success in the industry and the compromises and soul-selling that come from it. Things go badly in their relationship, and the game franchise they build is ultimately commercialized and compromised beyond recognition and out of their control. There are, to my mind, a couple of things this episode does particularly well within this framework that somehow also exemplify things that the show it's ostensibly a part of tends to do poorly. The first is that it understands that premise is a metaphor that's only valuable if you explore it. A Dark Quiet Death spends a good amount of time explaining the mechanics of its titular video game, at least as Beans idealizes it. Each word in the title represents something meaningful. The darkness is the primary game mechanic, in which a flashlight is the player's only means of vision through a horror-strewn world. The quiet represents the lack of violence or other means of fighting back against the monsters chasing the player. And death is the game's overriding metaphor, where there are no win states and nothing to do except flail against the nightmares until they destroy you. Now, we could spend a bit of time investigating whether Dark Quiet Death really makes sense as a video game, particularly one developed in the mid-90s that seems to enjoy moderate success. Enough success, at least, to lead a studio who took a flyer on its creation to greenlight a sequel. You could pick at its similarities to some survivor horror staples like Silent Hill and quibble with its perhaps anachronistic timeline. Silent Hill didn't actually release until 1999. This might all be interesting to a point, but only to a point, I think, because Dark Quiet Death is not real. And more importantly, the episode isn't about the realism, quote unquote, of such a game's existence, but instead about the game's value as a metaphor for an uncompromised artistic vision. Dark Quiet Death's premise is mined for all its metaphorical value in every scene of this episode. 
The flashlight, initially and ideally the game's only mode of interaction, becomes variously a totem and representation of achievement, disappointment, frustration, and grief. Violence and marketing becomes not just an over-the-top satire of M for Mature games development, but an explicit rejection and reversal of the game's stated purpose. And video game death is, of course, itself a powerful metaphor for permanence and impermanence in turn. This is all played with, turned on its head, and reflected back at the characters through the episode's runtime. Note that this is true even though, at no point in this episode do we watch anyone play a single second of this video game. It doesn't matter. The game's not about itself. It's about what it represents to these characters. And yet, the game is also specific enough in its conception that we understand why it means something to those characters, and the consequences of compromising or diluting that meaning. There's enough specificity and richness here to make the game work as a metaphor for the episode's runtime. Contrast this with the titular Mythic Quest. Build as an MMORPG that, as depicted, is a sort of light, vague World of Warcraft spoof, Mythic Quest has absolutely no raison d'etre, no metaphorical power and artistic vision beyond being a massively successful game that would necessitate the creation of the workplace where the show is set. It's nothing but a premise, in other words. The episode we're discussing even lampshades this with its single callback to the show proper at the very end, where Rob McElhenney's character states that his game's one unique feature is, well, him. No one working on the game Mythic Quest, in the show Mythic Quest, seems to have ever cared about it beyond using it as a measuring stick for their own career success. This isn't an inherently bad thing at all. Mythic Quest is a comedy, after all. It's working in a satirical mode more often than not. It's okay to populate your satire with a bunch of cynics who exploit a hollow shell of a property for their own ends. And it's even okay for people to work on something without caring about it, for something to have value without having quote-unquote great artistic meaning. Which means it's perfectly fine that we're supposed to root for and generally like these characters, despite the hollowness of their universe. But we'll get to the characters in a second. My point is that this isn't bad, so much as it is, in Mythic Quest, an empty premise, devoid of any thematic resonance. The emptiness hits hardest when the show tries to be sincere about the power of video games, because the game at its center, a game professed to be loved and acclaimed by most people in this universe, is nothing. And no one can point to anything that makes it specifically successful or interesting beyond a sort of tautological, video games are fun and good, therefore this video game is fun and good thesis. There's a telling joke in the fourth episode, where Mythic Quest's head writer shows off the emotional power of cutscenes to another character, except that none of the cutscenes he shows off are from the game he's written. The punchline in the script is that the writer's not actually very good at writing for video games, but the second, more confusing punchline to me is that the games tester he is showing this to, someone who is supposed to have played this game for hundreds of hours, also doesn't recognize that any of these cutscenes would or wouldn't be from the game she ostensibly loves. So the meta punchline here is that I don't think Mythic Quest has any idea what a cutscene in its video game would look like. Scene transitions in this show are littered with cutscene-style video game sequences that look like they're pulled from maybe a dozen random genres and video game styles, with no clear bearing on or relationship to the mythic quest that's supposed to drive the plot and the character motivations. This isn't just a problem of not being able to write long-winded assessments of a metaphor. What it means, for me as a viewer, is that I don't care nearly as much as the show wants me to about the insertion of a shovel into the gameplay mechanics, the A-plot of the show's pilot, because I do not understand, and have never been made to understand, why or how a shovel actually matters to the game, or to the characters quibbling over the details of its inclusion. They might as well be arguing over paper. Dark Quiet Death is an intentional inversion of a specific genre. First-person shooters, primarily the demon-soaked, over-the-top violent ones prevalent in the immediate post-Doom late 90s. And so, it gets to comment on that genre, as well as do metaphorical conversations about what that genre means. It's just specific enough about how the game might play that it can use the conventions of its genre to its benefit both for theming and storytelling, 
Mythic Quest does not dive at all into the specifics of its ostensible genre, presumably in order to keep its premise broad enough to skip across the full spectrum of video game jokes that it might have in mind. But this lack of specificity means that neither jokes nor emotional weight have any core to hang on to. The closest the show gets to hitting on the quirks of its specific milieu is when it broaches the social dynamics of players in a multiplayer game. But it mostly does so in ways that suggest it doesn't understand how these things can be assets as well as issues to a game like this. Namely, there's an episode about Nazis, and the progression and conclusion of that plot about Nazis in this video game suggests that there's not much the show has to discuss about a video game social mechanics except how Nazis might use them. If you've picked MMORPGs as your genre of choice for the premise of your television show, this lack of interest is particularly bizarre. Massively multiplayer is right there in the acronym, and the genre exists in constant conversation with how player interaction and social dynamics can dictate both gameplay and storytelling, whether intentional or emergent, within a persistent game universe. That the show never really grapples with this means it leaves a critical piece of its premise on the cutting room floor. I said I'd get back to the characters, though, so let's do that. The other thing A Dark Quiet Death understands that Mythic Quest, at least early on, really doesn't, is that characters only matter if they're motivated. Now a singular 20 to 30 minute episode has an advantage here because it gets to tell a complete story with a much smaller roster of characters. But A Dark Quiet Death is nonetheless a solid case study in building and following characters whose shared and conflicting motivations drive the evolution and conclusion of the narrative. It's also clever and not entirely binary about how it does this. Beans is the idealist who refuses to compromise her vision, except she agrees to compromise on it up to a point, trying to save both the core of her game and her marriage, although she does lose both. Doc is vulnerable to the seduction of success as defined by the marketing department and sacrifices the game toward that end. He's the cynical, money-obsessed one. Except, he refuses to compromise past a certain, granted more extreme, point and is ejected from his own game studio as a result. This works partially because of my previous point. That is to say, the video game premise is functioning as metaphor and is thematically linked to who these people are, what they want, and what they mean to each other. But it's also smart, direct characterization focused on motivation. From their very first scene together, we understand Doc and Bean's mutual philosophies, and we can see and perhaps anticipate how they will work together and even drift apart over time, so that in the space of this 20 plus minute vignette, we empathize with them as people in relationships, both with each other and with their life's work. As I mentioned before, no one in proper mythic quest is defined by what they specifically value in the titular game or really in the games industry at all. Again, this isn't necessarily a problem, except they're not really defined by much of anything else. I could describe each character's core motivation as expressed in the first handful of episodes thus. They are self-interested, want to be seen as successful, and want to exploit the game and their place in the game's industry to that end. It's not just that none of them is an idealist, I don't care about that. It's that none of them are especially different from one another after a certain point so that I can't track or care much about their respective journeys. Even within that framework, characterization in Mythic Quest can be described generously as shaky. Confident characters will crumble for a punchline. Smart characters will act exceedingly stupid to progress a plot point. And at least in one case, a relatively sane-seeming character becomes completely insane just because I guess the writers think it's funnier. Lead developer Poppy is treated worst by this aspect of the writing. Marketing asshole Brad is perhaps the most consistently drawn, but given that his entire character is asshole, it's hard to give out much credit for that. The game studio's leads are maybe worse for not having clear characterization or motivation though. And actually, when I mention the game studio now, a quick aside, is the game studio in this show also called Mythic Quest? Why is that how this works? It's a super bizarre little detail, obviously, in the scheme of things, but it really confused me while I was watching it. Mythic Quest is a take on a World of Warcraft style game. Blizzard is not called World of Warcraft or even Warcraft. 
why don't you take the extra second of world building to make an actual name for your studio that would contextualize this at least a little bit better? It also kind of makes Mythic Quest feel even more like a weird vacuum uh, and not really an exploration of the space it's ostensibly a part of. But okay, anyway, uh, tangent over. Rob McElhenney's Ian is a narcissist who's given just enough intelligence and self-awareness to make his narcissism more frustrating than illuminating. Whether or not he is oblivious to a given aspect of reality depends entirely on the whims of a given script rather than a strong understanding of what he actually wants as a person. David Hornsby's character, David, is literally paralyzed by indecision and has no reason to want or need to be working specifically for this company as opposed to anywhere else for any reason. That might be a pretty funny character beat if it stood in strong enough contrast to anyone else. And as a, another side note, all of this would probably be a lot better if the show were funnier than it was. You don't tend to nitpick comedies when they're funny. So all of this should be taken with a sort of overlying critique of Mythic Quest is not funny enough to get away with any of this. Setting that aside, I'm focusing on motivation here first and foremost, because in my experience, the best narratives run on an engine of character motivation. What people want leads them to do something that leads to consequences, that leads to others' reactions. I don't think you need to have studied much storytelling theory or read any books about screenwriting to understand that this is what we mean when we talk about conflict and stories. It's clashing motivations and the actions driven by those motivations. It's plot. Contrivance and deus ex machina are the mean words and phrases we use to describe when a story has failed to introduce enough motivated action to do anything without the hand of God writer sweeping down to force things to happen. Even in comedies, when sometimes things just happen because they're funny, you still need some kind of a spine here. But Mythic Quest instead is full of nothing but contrivance. To be honest with you, if it weren't for the episode A Dark Quiet Death, I would never have had much more than a shrug and a couple of non-committal words to say about Mythic Quest. It's not a show that merits much consideration beyond that to my eyes. I mean, it's a comedy that's not very funny. It's hard to get past that. But that pretty quick assessment changed abruptly with the sudden clarity of a strong spine story dunked into the center of a nondescript season. The presence of something here made it a lot easier to talk about what had been absent. Mythic Quest could get really good after this episode. And I should note that the standalone nature of Dark Quiet Death is only true insofar as I know that as of the episode's end. Like I said at the top, we're only talking about the show up to the end of that episode. For all I know, the larger story lore of this season will tie back to this episode in a way that mutually benefits the thematic and character work of each. Not that I necessarily want it to. Like I said, I think Dark Quiet Death works a lot better as a vignette than Mythic Quest works as a television show, but there's potential there. Instead though, Dark Quiet Death, as episode five of this particular season, ends up being almost the opposite of what I think the writers intended it to be. Rather than a deeper articulation of the larger story's running themes and concerns, it ends up functioning better as a wide flashlight beam cast onto the empty dirt where the season's foundations were supposed to be.